Hi, I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Joe Payne, president and CEO at Code42. For nearly 20 years, Code42 has been safeguarding the data of more than 50,000 organizations, including 18 of the world's most valuable brands. To learn more about Code42, visit Code42.com. Joe, welcome. Great to have you with us today. I'm thrilled to be here. So, Joe, we're here to talk about the insider threat today. Not only does Code42 take an entirely different approach to protecting against it, but you also co-authored a book on the topic. I happen to have it here with me today. Um, I read the book. Great book. Uh, so uh, appreciate that. Uh, why, Joe, let me ask, uh, is the insider risk uh, the greatest threat? Let's just start there. It's the premise for the book. Yeah, and thank you, by the way, for reading Inside Jobs. And um, I hope you didn't have to buy it on Amazon, but if you did, thank you for increasing our numbers. We, we greatly appreciate it. Um, listen, it's like anything else that, that uh, causes change is um, the world has changed. The, the world has changed fundamentally in, um, in the area of security and culture. And so uh, we try to address what's changed and why and sort of give some solutions. So let's, let's talk about that change for just a second. We're sort of three major drivers. Uh, two of them are technical and one of them is cultural. Uh, the first is that there's been a just great prolifer proliferation of collaboration tools out there. Things like Slack and Teams and OneDrive and Box and Dropbox. And these tools have, have made it really easy for teams to work together, uh, often in a distributed fashion, and share information and share content and share ideas. And they've been great for our, our economy. Um, but they're all about sharing information. So, so that's, that's a big change that's happened. I think most organizations have felt that. Um, the second, um, and, and I'll talk about the context of why that matters in just a second when we go through all three of them. The second thing is we have a distributed workforce and, um, and we're using a lot of distributed technology and people are working from home and they're, uh, they're working from uh, Starbucks and they're working from, uh, you know, different offices uh, all around the world. And so there's lots more people that are spread out and they're not inside the corporate network as maybe people used to be uh, 10, e even five years ago. People are technically outside the corporate network. And the third thing is uh, we're seeing this cultural change where people are um, decreasing tenure in, in their companies and their organizations. So um, Gen Y and, and Gen Z to pretty much work about three years before they switch companies and they switch jobs. Um, for the rest of us, the average is about four years. So you see a lot less loyalty to an organization and not only less loyalty, but people are moving from job to job and they they have a tendency to want to take some of their work with them. So when you bring all those things together, which is lots of sharing of information, lots of people working outside the network, and lots of people changing jobs, what we've seen is a, just a massive increase in the number of people that take data with them um, when they move from job to job. Our, our data shows that 60% of people admit that they took data from their last job to use in their current job. And um, that's just the people that admit it. We think it's uh, that, that it's above 90. So that's, that's really, the book is really about telling that story, explaining why that's happening and talking about some of the solutions that teams can take that are different and, and new. So I'm curious, Joe, you've built a company, Code42, great reputation. A lot of people uh, follow the company. You've got a great platform. Now you write a book. Did you learn anything more about the insider threat in the process of writing and publishing that book? That's a great question. And the, and the answer, of course, is yes. Um, you know, when, when we started digging into it, we just talked to more people and we just probably got even more convicted. You know, we have more conviction on the problem that we're trying to solve. And um, we, we, the more we dug in, the more we realized that what was required was a completely new approach to solving the problem. You know, the old approach to dealing with insider threat was stop people from doing stuff. Don't let them put something on a thumb drive. Don't let them, you know, uh, let's block every kind of sharing that they might do. Let's block them from going to certain websites. And um, those old approaches are completely inadequate in, in, in today's world. They, first of all, they simply technically don't work anymore. Um, but maybe even more importantly, 
they go against the entire cultural change that's happened in terms of sharing and collaboration. So you have the CEO and the CIO telling the entire organization, we want you to share, we want you to collaborate, we want you to get, you know, share data with each other. And then you've got the CISO saying, wait, my job is to block all that collaboration because it creates risk. And so you, you get this thing going. So in writing the book, we just ran into story after story on that. And, um, and, and, if it, and we, we left that process of writing the book even more convinced that, that this change has to occur. So, Joe, I want to ask you about Code 42's technology, but before we go there, uh, I was on your website, uh, very well done, and you had some great statistical information. Some of it, frankly, I found uh, staggering, did some research, uh, you know, wanted to vet some of the figures, and and they're accurate, but they're still staggering. 66% of breaches involve insider threats, and over the past two years, we've seen a 47% uh, jump help put those numbers in perspective because they really are very big numbers. Yeah, I think those numbers surprise everybody when we when we first show them to them. And, you know, it's not only 66% of breaches, but it's also only 10% of the organization's security budget today is focused on those insider breaches. So we're spending 90% of our time and our money and our effort on Uh, Important problems, you know, malware, phishing, hackers, nation states, that's those are important problems. And we've spent all that money to address those problems. And we're getting better in in those areas for sure. In the meantime, we've spent no money addressing the other side of the coin, which is, hey, actually, a lot of our data, two thirds of the time, it's leaving because our employees are taking it with them. I, I personally think it's because um, the organizations haven't been watching the store. And what I mean by that is like, it's so easy for an employee to take data today and go unrecognized and unnoticed um, by their organization. And so the more people do that and the more times they switch a job and do that and nothing happens, the more it feels like, hey, no one's watching the store. So we might as well grab this, uh, this particular candy bar. It's not hurting anybody, et cetera. So that's I think that's really what's uh, what's driving it today. And so one of the things that we tell our uh, that we tell our customers uh, um, who often come to us, not just for technology, but for advice on how to take on the problem is you really need to be transparent and you need to talk about this problem and you need to explain to folks, um, you know, that you have technology that's that's watching. Um, their data movement, and you also um, want to train them on what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And as soon as you have people sort of start watching this store, we see that those numbers come down pretty dramatically. So Joe, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're in a situation where tens of millions of people have gone to work from home. And I you know, think about uh, a Fortune 500 company that might have anywhere from 10, 15,000 to as many as 80 to 100,000 or more people. I mean, that has to amplify the insider threat. Uh, what are you seeing? What observations do you have for CISOs? It, it does for sure. For first of all, everybody's now off the network. There's no question that any of those network-based tools that you have aren't working. Um, but not only that, everyone's getting more fluid in how to use cloud uh, sharing applications. And again, those are good things. We're not against those applications. Uh, in fact, like we embrace them. And, and we embrace the culture that says we should be working uh, together. Um, but you you lose visibility very quickly of of where data goes and and how people are moving that data uh, on the one hand, and so having uh, some technology in place to wrap security around that, like you know, I, I should mention what are, you know the the things the way people take data uh, most frequently. There's sort of three ways that people take data. Um, the first is they Gmail it to themselves. So they just open up a web browser and um, and they open up their Gmail account and they attach a file and they send it to themselves. And if they do that, they now have that file forever, right? Most technology solutions that are out there to solve this problem don't address that in any way, shape, or form. Code 42 does, but like most don't address that. So that's a big way. The second way is they send it to their own Dropbox account. Same process. They just upload it via browser uh, while they're off the network. That's very hard for most organizations to see. And then the third way they do it is they attach a thumb drive uh, to their uh, to their USB port. Now, many companies will say, oh, that's not happening in my organization because you know, we've turned off all USB drives. But it turns out that there's so many security, there's so many peripherals today that have USB ports in them that you might 
in your monitor, in your keyboard, uh, and, your, and there's all kinds of hubs that people use. It's very, very hard technically to shut that down. And so um, monitoring those particular areas turns out to be really important. Now, when you talk about the uh, employees um, that, are, that are at home, we really worry um, about data exfiltration. And some, some, some folks have said, well, um, that's okay. We're, we've got some blocking technology up. We're going to get in their way. What we've learned is that 37% um, of, uh, of people that we talk to about this problem of employees, basically when they get stopped by doing something, say, for example, that USB port was shut down and they plug their drive and it doesn't work. The next thing they do is find a workaround uh, to, to get, they go to a file sharing site or they use their Dropbox account, et cetera. And so some of the technology that's in use out there today, trying to get in the way of, of employees and, you know, it's, it's good intentions. People are trying to block employees from taking data they shouldn't, but employees are, it's so easy to find ways around that with some of that old technology that they, they make the problem even worse because then they use Dropbox, et cetera, et cetera. So we're seeing a big cultural change that, that because people are now working from home, it's just accelerated it. So again, nothing really new so much as it's moved faster and more employees are involved. So I'm just curious, Joe, do you think some of that is psychological, not just the fact that, um, you know, people are on their own and, you know, they, they don't have the same controls they do in an, in an office environment, but do they also maybe feel empowered to, you know, quote, get away with things when they're home? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, people people are like, no one's really watching me. I'm sitting at home. I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm not on the network, you know. And no one said anything, and so they they feel, you know. And there's a lot of nervousness about jobs right now. People are nervous. What if I get laid off? What if I go to my next thing? And so maybe I need some information, etc. And and I think um, you know one of the things that we talk a lot about at Code Forty Two is assume positive intent. And we we come at this problem assuming positive intent. We assume most employees are actually trying to do the right thing with their organizations. And then they sometimes go astray uh, because you know it's tempting to take something or maybe they don't even understand. I mean, we've talked to engineers who've taken source code and they've said, well, but I wrote that source code. And so like, that's my source code. I'm really proud of it. I wanna take it with me to my next job. And there, that's a training issue where the organizations needs to you know, remind employees, okay, so that source code's really important source code. We're grateful you wrote it, but like we paid you to write it. And so you're not really allowed to take that kind of source code. Um, and so that's an example of, uh, particularly with younger employees, they, they just need some, they need some training and some coaching um, in ways that you didn't have to do 20 years ago because you couldn't just walk up and take stuff like that. Today, right. everything's portable. Our customer lists are portable. Our HR information is portable. Our source code is portable. Everything is electronic now, and therefore, it's not like you have to run into the office at midnight and copy it on the copier. You you can simply um, you know you can simply grab a file and move it. And so that's that's also part of the cultural change. It's really it's made it so easy to take information, and we have to keep reminding people that that's uh, that's not okay. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that you know, maybe 10% or so of a budget is devoted to the inside of threat, even though it's, uh, you know, wreaking havoc on companies. So let's talk about what type of damage it's causing. Sounds to me like just in a few minutes, millions of dollars uh, in damage can be inflicted on a company. One of the statistics uh, I read on your site is that the average uh, insider breach or threat breach, you know, generated by an insider is costing $11 million. Where, yeah, where does that figure come from? And you know, tell us about that. That that comes from some research that we did, but I couldn't I couldn't cite the exact uh, uh, location of that research. But I will tell you that that that's a staggering number, and I think that's probably because so much insider uh, uh, threat and so much insider risk and so many exfiltrations go unreported at this time um, that that the ones that get reported are are just this the amount of uh, damage is, is staggering. I mean, we've, we've seen them in the public domain. We've seen, um, you know, when Anthony Lewandowski left Google and went to Uber, um, you know, he took all the self-driving, a lot of the self-driving, uh, technology with him. Um, and we saw how damaging that was to Google. And so you see those, those big ones, but, you know, I'll tell you, it's not just that these are happening on a regular basis and, and they're very hard to pin down, uh, from, from, a from a value standpoint, let's take an example. Uh, that's also been very public, 
because it's it's kind of embarrassing to the company that's involved, but it's you know McAfee, um, who has some of that old DLP technology that they use in their shop. They, they've had a very public spat with three ex employees who left, and um, they took all their sales information with them, and they they took all their customer lists, and they took um, uh, some of the key information about their prospect lists and their pipeline. And that information can be worth literally millions of dollars to the competitor that they went to. And, um, and, and so you see when those uh, when people decide, hey, we're going to go aggressively sue people for, for taking that data, you see those big uh, numbers. But I think a lot of the breaches out there are probably, you know, in the more million dollar range, but they're extraordinarily damaging um, and hard to clean up and hard to, uh, to deal with after the fact. Our approach at Code 42 is to let people know when that data exfiltration and when those risks are occurring while the employee is still employed at the organization or is maybe just leaving an organization so you can nip those problems in the bud and instead of having a big giant lawsuit, you can solve the problem uh, early and, and, and quickly. And that's a, key, that's a key difference between us and maybe some of the other players in our space. So your book is new, but Code42 uh, has been at this for years. Uh, the name of your platform, and let me make sure that I spell this out for people because it's great branding. I love the name Insider, spelled I-N-C-Y-D-R. First, I have to ask, do you get credit for that, Joe, or is that somebody else? Because it's a great name. No, my marketing team came up with that, and they and it is a fantastic name. And then they even came up with a better T-shirt to, to go with it. Uh, they, they said, because protecting your data is more important than winning the National Spelling Bee. And, uh, and I love that T-shirt, so, so uh, they, did a, they did a fantastic job with that. So give us a 30,000-foot view of Insider. Uh, you know, what is it, and how does it work? Yeah, so Insider basically collects lots of information from uh, from employees. And, and essentially what it, it does that in a couple ways. The first thing we put a small agent on the endpoint uh, on a laptop, for example, and that agent watches uh, all the file movement on that laptop. And when files get uploaded to Dropbox or uploaded to, uh, to Gmail, or the uh, files get put on a thumb drive or an external hard drive, um, it captures all that information and, and stores that uh, centrally in a, cl in a cloud cluster in Amazon. At the same time, we pull information from OneDrive or Box or G Drive, uh, whatever the organization is using uh, from a collaboration tool standpoint, so that we can give a complete view of an employee's activity uh, to the security organization. And the, the way that the product works is designed not to overload the security team with lots and lots of data. It's designed to sit in the background and, and carefully watch all users and all data and only um, report the, uh, problems to the security team after a number of insider risk indicators have fired. So what's an example of an insider risk indicator? Well, um, somebody changing file extensions from a zip drive uh, or a zip file to a, a, a picture or a, a song and make it look like, hey, I'm taking my music in my pictures, but I'm not taking this important information. That's an indicator of risk. Somebody working at off hours. So our system looks at everybody's normal hours. Um, yours are different than mine. And it says, oh, when you're working off hours, we know from our research that you're more likely to be doing something um, that you shouldn't be doing. And so that's an insider risk indicator. Or maybe even just creating zip files, because zip files pretty much aren't used in organizations very often today, other than to obfuscate and encrypt uh, important data. So those are examples of insider risk indicators. The ultimate example of an insider risk indicator is, is that you quit. And um, because people actually really execute on a plan to take data when they leave. And they don't do it after they quit. They do it before they quit. So they, they take data two weeks ago, then they quit, and then, and then they give you two weeks notice. Our system is constantly watching everybody for the last 90 days and, um, and not interrupting their work, not slowing them down, not blocking any of their collaboration or sharing. But if they trigger a number of insider risk indicators, then we serve up a profile uh, to the uh, security team and they can decide um, how or if they need to uh, to respond to that. So um, that's kind of a basic of how of how Insider works. 
Um, and it's really designed to help the security teams identify and get ahead of any, of any data spilling out of the organization. So I'm curious about where the demand's coming from. Code uh, 42 has been very successful. I think you've got more than 50,000 customers, if I have the number right. But is there you know, particular interest from companies that are protecting intellectual property, manufacturing, entertainment, the legal industry? Or are we at a point now where the insider threat is just so great that you know, all industries are uh, equally interested? You've 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 uh, nailed a couple of key areas that we uh, that we have success. So certainly, where organizations have um, intellectual property that's easy to move, so technology companies, uh, professional services companies, uh, entertainment companies, all those are are uh, clearly interested in this space. But maybe what's more interesting is sort of the psychographics of the type of company. Um, so what we found is we we call them progressive companies. They're, they're companies that have um, employees that work from home or they work from distributed locations and they use these collaborative technologies and they do want to assume positive intent with their employees. They don't want to block them. They don't want to assume that they're doing, uh, doing bad things. And so it's sort of a psychographic combination with a couple of key, uh, key industries. And, um, but you know, it's across, I mean, we have customers like, uh, CrowdStrike and, uh, Ping Identity, both important security companies uh, that use our product. But we have uh, companies like um, uh, Biota Home Healthcare, so a, a company that's in the healthcare space. Uh, we have uh, an HVAC company named McDonald Miller, who is a company of ours. You, you wouldn't think, oh, HVAC, how, how, you know, do they have to worry about their important information? Well, of course they do, because they actually, using our technology, caught one of their employees going to a competitor and taking some of their most important information. And so we see it doesn't really matter the industry um, so much as it matters sort of the approach. It says, look, we've got uh, a lot of workers working on laptops, working distributed, and, and we need to protect. Uh, we really need to mine the store and make sure that our data is not is not leaving. So you were mentioning some prominent companies uh, that you work with clients, CrowdStrike being one of them. Uh, George Kurtz, the CEO at CrowdStrike, wrote the forward to your book. I'm curious, what did he have to say? Yeah, George uh, George is very passionate about uh, about changing the world using uh, new technology, and they have done that over at CrowdStrike. And so he just talks a little bit about the journey in, in our book about about how they've changed the world and, and really ties that into sort of the journey that we're beginning at Code 42. And so I expect that anyone watching this um, or listening to this is, you know, I don't want to say, hey, we're comparing ourselves to CrowdStrike. They're much bigger than we are. They've had great success. But uh, I've known George for 20 some years and, um, and I'm impressed with what they've done. And I ask him, hey, can you tell your story as an analogy to what we're doing and how we're doing it? And because they're a partner and because they're a, one of our better customers, um, they, he agreed to do that. And that was, uh, you know, that's something. And, you know, if you think about what CrowdStrike does, CrowdStrike really looks for all of that, um, uh, you know, those cyber threats that come from the outside of the organization. And there's nobody better in the world at that than they are. We really focus on the inside of the organization. So when you put those side by side, it's a great match. We use CrowdStrike at Code42 um, they use us at, at CrowdStrike, so it's, it's a great partnership. So we were lucky and happy to have George uh, agree to write the forward. Great company. Uh, we've uh, done some work with them, and uh, we actually have a new series that's going to be coming out with CrowdStrike. So I want to ask you a final question, Joe. You've touched on this a couple of times, and I can't get it out of my head as we talk about how serious this threat is, that 10%, the budget that's being devoted to deal with this. Is that starting to inch up? Do you see that, you know, becoming, you know, a, a larger budget item for CISOs? I think so. And I, I think the reason you're going to see CISOs budget for it in 2021 in particular is um, this the COVID crisis that you mentioned earlier has really pushed people um, out to the edge of the network, or basically off the network. And so we're seeing um, the problem be more pronounced now. So I think you're going to see that. And the other thing is, you know, Forrester just announced their predictions for next year uh, last week, and their number one prediction in all of cybersecurity is that the uh, insider threat will increase next year. And it's 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 the focus uh, of their the very first prediction that they make. So I think 
when Forrester and Gartner and IDC and the rest of the analyst community are fo focused on that problem, I, I think you begin to see CISOs pay, pay attention and increase their budgets. And it also makes it easier when you're going to your CIO or you're talking to your CEO about the problem um, to point to some of the analysts in the industry, as opposed to the just pointing to the vendors. So expect people to, to budget a lot more next year, and, and we'll see that 10% that inch up. So I did, in fact, buy a copy of the book. Uh, we hope that anybody who's watching will. So again, Joe, uh, is it Amazon? Is that primarily where people should be going for the book? It's at Amazon. Uh, it's called Inside Jobs. Uh, the funny thing is we were going to put it in bookstores all around the nation in airports, but it turns out that nobody is in airports anymore, so not a great place for the book. So easy to find on Amazon. Thanks so much today for, for the time, Steve, and I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. Hope to have you back on. Great. I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. Joining us today was Joe Payne, president and CEO at Code42. For nearly 20 years, Code42 has been safeguarding the data of more than 50,000 organizations, including 18 of the world's most valuable brands. To learn more about our sponsor, Code42, visit code42.com. You can keep up with all of our media at cybercrimemagazine.com.